What's up, y'all? Welcome to episode two of our coffee Q&A. Um, the last episode went pretty great. Uh, we got some good questions coming in from our customers and friends, uh, and we'd love to keep this going. So right off the bat, I'm gonna tell you, if you've got a coffee-related question, any kind, anything goes, um, just give us a shout. Leave us a comment here on this video. Uh, hit us up on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook for social media, or send us your questions to questions at prima-coffee.com. We'd love to hear from you. We'll try to help you find your answers. And if you submit a question, it could be in an upcoming video. So today we've got a whole bunch of fresh questions from our fans. And we're gonna get right off started with Monty who asks, he's asking about a Bellman stovetop steamer, which I've got right here. Uh, and he's saying that uh, there's some chalky deposits on the inside and he's got questions about keeping it clean, more or less. Um, so how do you take care of one of these guys? What's the maintenance like uh, and all that? So number one, first and foremost is uh, wipe and purge your steam wand after every use. Um, that's just good practice for pretty much any steam wand uh, on any machine or a bellman or what have you. Um, you wanna make sure that that wand stays clean and free of blockage so you can keep it, you know, using it and it doesn't get funky and gross with milk residue. Um, so I like to use a wet rag for that, just, you know, like a micro, uh, microfiber cloth or something like that. Just kinda of wipe it off at the end, open it up and open up the valve and purge it out. Um, and, you know, in a cafe, you probably would soak your wands in something like milk wash um, for five to 10 minutes at the end of the day because um, that helps break up those milk proteins and sugars and stuff and all that residue um, and keeps everything nice and clean. If you're really only using something like this a few times a week, um, you probably don't need to do that too often, but you might want to maybe get some milk wash as well for that periodic, you know, every few months cleaning. Inside, um, chalky residue is usually some kind of scale buildup. Um, and that's actually pretty easy to clean. Um, I would say if you are seeing chalky buildup, maybe switch to a different water. Um, distilled water would be great for a steamer like this. Um, if it's just sort of a slow buildup over time, probably not that big of a deal. Um, to get rid of deposits like that, you can get a commercial descaler. Um, there's all kinds of coffee descaling products on the market, like Ernex, uh, Descal, all kinds of stuff like that. Or if you want to kind of do more of that homebrew route, um, white vinegar is pretty easy cheap um, and just the acidity of the vinegar helps kind of break up all that stuff um, i personally prefer to use citric acid because it doesn't have that vinegar kind of odor that lingers um, citric acid is something you can find at a lot of like home um, beer brewing shops uh, because it's i guess it's used in beer brewing either for flavoring or cleaning or what have you um, it's usually pretty cheap and you don't need a lot of it. So for a Bellman steamer, I would use maybe like half a teaspoon um, and some hot water and just let it sit for an hour or so. Um, and then empty it out, give it a rinse, and hopefully you'll have uh, a, a nice shiny clean Bellman that's free of residue. So that is our tips for cleaning your Bellman. Our next question uh, from Russell, who is asking about dialing in a knock Feld 2 hand grinder for Kalita. Uh, 185, 155, and even a Hario V60. So dialing in any grinder is, uh, it's sort of a bit of a process. Uh, you know, finding the right grind size for your brewing methods or even for the beans that you're using can be, um, I mean, it can be a little bit daunting. It's not that difficult, but it's just, it's something that you sort of go by feel so it doesn't necessarily seem like it's a very intuitive process sometimes. Um, on the knock, on the Feld 2, the way that we talk about grind settings, uh, we have this dial here, it has 12 numbers stamped on the top, and we have the little arrow in the handle. So when we are talking about grind settings on a Feld, or Feld 2, or an air grind, um, you are talking about total revolutions around the wheel uh, from the zero point where the burrs are touching. Um, so even coming back to a grind setting can kind of be a little bit of a chore because you have to go all the way fine first and then back it off. Uh, so for pour overs, we tend to stick to either three or four revolutions on the dial. Um, right now I have it at a three six, so it's about three and a half full revolutions. And I would say that that's a good starting place for a Kalita 155 or 185. It depends on your coffee. Um, you know, you're gonna need to change your grind setting depending on how lightly roasted that coffee is or how much coffee you're using in your dose. 
you would tend to grind a little bit coarser if you're using more coffee. Uh, or if you're using a lighter coffee, you might grind finer than a darker coffee. So there's still a little bit of wiggle room, but somewhere in that three to four revolutions range uh, is where we would start for most pour over brewing. Um, the V60 we would tend a little bit finer typically because it has such a high flow rate through the bottom of the cone. Um, so you grind your, your coffee a little bit finer to compensate for that. Um, every brewer is a little bit different, every coffee is a little bit different, but again, that sort of general three to four revolutions range on the Feld 2 is probably where we would start. Um, this is also something that kind of comes with practice. As you, you know, brew more coffees, try out different beans, try out different roasters, or even different brewing devices, um, you start to get a feel for how you want to grind your coffee. Um, and I would say when you're just starting out, focus on um, grinding uh, your coffee for time first. So when you're brewing, um, grind your coffee for you know your three minute brew target. Um, if you are going too long, you've probably ground too fine. If you're going too short, you've probably ground too coarse. Um, so make those corrections, try to get the time right, and then from there you can worry about kind of more you know different pouring methods or um, kind of dialing things in more for flavor. Um, I have found that getting the timing right, and I tend to aim for three to three and a half minute brews for most of my pour overs, and that's usually like a, a one to two person, person batch size. Um, I found that aiming for that target time is a really good starting place for me and, and how I like to brew coffee. Um, so, you know, you may wanna try that out and see if that works for you as well. Um, so grind, grind for time, try to get your target brew time, and then make tweaks for flavor. Um, that's a great way to get started in learning how to make these adjustments and get your coffee tasting superb and, and super tasty and impress all your friends. Uh, all right, so our next question is from Adam. And uh, Adam is asking, uh, he's got a few different questions sort of rolled into one, um, kind of talking about how to pick a grinder for brewing methods. So Adam has a Technivorm Mocha Master, which is an automatic coffee brewer, like a small um, you know, consumer auto drip brewer. Um, but they also say that they're, uh, they don't drink French press or pour overs, but they're also interested in getting into espresso in the near future. And they also have some concerns about the noise of an electric grinder. So um, uh, it's a very broad question. Um, I, I would say that you know, in our experience, Baratza's line of products are some of the best home grinders we've seen on the market. Um, they all have kind of different sort of strengths and weaknesses. Um, if you are looking for a really good um, electric home grinder that could do espresso down the road, um, I would say that the Baratza Vario or the Forte, uh, either of those models with the steel burrs, which are, uh, the Forte has a model, the BG, comes with the steel burrs already. You can buy the steel burrs for the, the Vario um, either of those grinders are going to be really superb for that grinding for your auto drip and you know maybe anywhere from you know the the one pot that you and your uh, you know your family have in the morning versus you know entertaining and you need to make a few back to back um, anything like that also can be dialed down to making some really excellent espresso down the road um, they are more expensive though those are two of Baratza's most expensive grinders um, the Virtuoso uh, Plus, which is their newest sort of mid-entry uh, grinder, is pretty good for those drip brew settings, but it's not going to be very good for espresso. It doesn't really have the fine-tuned adjustment that you tend, tend to need for making great espresso. Um, that is sort of the, one of the trade-offs of buying a grinder like that, um, is it's pretty good for drip coffee, but not a lot of uh, other brewing methods. Um, the Virtuoso Plus is probably one of the most popular grinders that, um, or the Virtuoso, the, 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 which preceded the Plus, um, was probably one of Baratza's most popular grinders. The Plus has added a few features. Um, it's still the same internally and still the same quality. So uh, that's probably the best starting point. I would say maybe once you get to the point where you're looking at espresso, look at another grinder that can be dedicated to espresso. Um, that team tends to be the, the way to avoid headache. Um, and it's, it is uh, more expensive to buy two grinders than one, sure. Um, but you know, if you were to have a Virtuoso for your drip coffee and a Sete for your, um, 
for your espresso or even, you know, maybe you're more comfortable spending a little bit more and you get a Mazer, like a mini or a Super Jolly for your espresso. Having that purpose-built espresso grinder is gonna give you really good results. And since you're not messing with it, trying to make brewed coffee and espresso, you know, in the same machine, um, you don't really have to worry too much about uh, like getting back to where you were, where your shots tasted good, or getting, you know, trying to clear out the dust and fines from that really fine espresso grind when you're trying to make your batch brew drip coffee. So there's there's a lot of considerations that kind of go both ways. I think my, my general recommendation is to look at maybe getting two grinders if you're really gonna seriously get into home espresso. Um, it just kind of makes life a little bit easier that way. All right, so our next question comes from Andrew. I'm planning on purchasing a manual grinder primarily for espresso and V60 brew with the occasional French press thrown in. I've narrowed my choices to the Kinu M47 Traveler, the Healer 101, and the Commandante C40. Uh, initially, I've been leaning toward the Healer, but it seems you're out of stock. Sorry. Uh, do you have a time frame for when you will be restocking these? Uh, if it's gonna be weeks, I'll probably go to the Kinu etc. Um, yeah, so stock, um, unfortunately, some of the people who make really great hand grinders um, are smaller companies, and smaller companies um, can be hit with enormous demand that they weren't really expecting, and uh, stock can get a little thin here and there. Um, we do what we can, you know, we, we try to order as much as we can, we try to keep everything in stock, but we tend to have back orders lining up for, uh, for a lot of our hand grinders. Um, I would say that the best way to know the current stock status for the products that we carry is of course to look at the website, take a look at the, the product listings. We try to keep those up to date uh, as often as we can. Um, the other thing is, you know, just give us a call. Uh, we might have information that hasn't made it to the website yet. Um, so if you give our customer service team a call, um, they can let you know the most up to date info and uh, hopefully help you make a decision that way. Really, again, I, you know, we're, we're always very sorry that, you know, uh, uh, an exciting product is uh, out of stock or delayed. Um, it happens. There's not a lot that we can do about it, but we do try to keep, uh, at least keep the information out there and make sure that everybody's kind of updated on where things are at. Um, so I, I don't know the lead times off the top of my head, um, but again, check those product listings and give us a call if you like. Okay, so our next question is... Uh, from Phillips, and Phillips asks, if I buy a Kinu grinder, can I pick up or is it delivery only? So uh, as much as we would love to have our friends come in and say hello in person, our office is basically just an office and a warehouse and we don't really have uh, a storefront right now. Um, so we don't really encourage people to come by. Uh, you know, I wish we had a little bit more. Um, we do have plans for a showroom and you know, a place to come and check out equipment and try it hands-on in person. Um, but that's not really here yet. So we'll definitely let everybody know once that happens. Um, we would love, I mean, honestly, I would love to have people come in and just say, hey, and let's talk about espresso machines or grinders and all that stuff. Like it would be so much fun. Um, but we're not quite there yet. So right now, yeah, it's just online only. And we do ask that, you know, if you're putting an order in, uh, we just need to get it shipped to you. Um, someday, someday. All right, next question is from Ben. Ben asks, what would you say are the pros and cons to having an espresso setup where the baristas just press the single or double button uh, and there's a preset volume of water that dispenses versus weighing the grams out for each shot on a scale? Right now we do the former, as in uh, going by volumetrics, uh, but I noticed many specialty shops weigh out each shot and what would be the pro to that? Well, I'd say that, um, you know, volumetrics are, they tend to be fairly consistent. Um, there was an article that uh, the La Marzocco blog published some years ago, I think uh, Ben Kaminsky wrote it, um, about you know, basically just testing the accuracy and consistency of volumetric dosing. And it turned out to be pretty darn good. Um, so at least the volumetrics on those La Marzocco machines that were involved in that test uh, were fairly consistent. Um, you know, sometimes over the lifetime of a machine, uh, you can have some blockage or scale or, or whatever, even just coffee residue kind of blocking your water path. And that might throw off not the actual water delivered because the machine is counting the, the flow meter um, pulses, like revolutions, um, but it might, it might affect how the water is delivered uh, to the coffee puck. 
So maybe there's a case to say that, you know, you should have a scale on hand to check your consistency, but volume metrics tend to be pretty good um, on a lot of machines. So it's kind of just, you know, how much do you trust your machine? If you don't feel like you trust your machine and you trust your scale more, if that is a concern, or maybe you're making a lot of adjustments and you don't want to rely on volume metrics because they take a lot of time to reprogram um, and you'd prefer to pull manual shots, you know, there, there's different ways to make espresso and there's different ways to sort of approach um, that coffee service as a sort of, uh, at least from a business standpoint. So, um, you know, having a scale uh, on the side to check your shot weight adds a little bit of time to the process. Maybe not a lot, um, but the, the quickest way certainly is to have, you know, an auto dosing grinder and a volumetric espresso machine and you just serve whatever comes out and hopefully it's pretty good because both those products are hopefully consistent. So it's it's kind of two sides uh, to, uh, well, it's it's two facets of a, a many faceted you know object in terms of how we serve espresso. Um, people have different priorities. Some people really, they, they just want to know that everything is right and that's why they're measuring. Um, and some people actually have cause to, to measure because their equipment isn't functioning perfectly consistently every time. So um, I would say that there's no right way to do it. I think that you can get good coffee out of um, a lot of different setups. Um, and you know, to most customers, it's what's in the cup that actually matters. Uh, so you know, you can go any which way with it, really. Um, at home, I prefer to take my time. You know, I have a scale, uh, I'm measuring everything. But it, when I'm behind bar in a cafe, um, I'm usually relying on volumetrics and I don't feel bad about that really because I think that at least in my experience those are fairly consistent and I'm serving a good product. Okay, so our next question comes from Maria and Maria asks, how do I learn to tech? Uh, I don't want to deal with uh, people ignoring me and then letting me know our equipment uh, needs exactly what I asked them for in the first place. This is a great question. It's also, it's very broad. Um, you know, there's a lot of different aspects to um, technical skills in terms of coffee equipment. Um, but there are some pretty good resources out there. Um, obviously, you know, we've done some technical videos here and there. We don't have like a big, you know, sort of technical skills course or anything like that. It's mostly stuff that like, you know, we've done videos about how to plumb in an espresso machine or how to change some gaskets out and that sort of thing. So, you know, not only us, but other folks on YouTube who are making these videos, there's a lot of good content out there. Um, they're like La Marzocco has manufacturer videos about their products and programming and that kind of thing. Um, there are videos like Mal or Malconic has videos about changing burrs or uh, calibrating grinders. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that's um, a little bit more simple. There's not a lot of videos out there for like diagnosing and repairing parts inside of an espresso machine, for example. Um, so that sort of thing might require a little bit more hands-on training. Um, you know, you might need to talk to Fetco about how to service and repair their products. Um, some manufacturers do have technical training courses that will teach you all the skills you need and how to work with their products um, and get certified. So, you know, the approach that you take kind of depends on what you want to get out of it. If you just want to know, you know, more or less how to uh, do basic maintenance and stuff, that information tends to be really easy to find. It's the stuff that gets a little bit more into the guts and maybe requires a little bit more uh, experience in terms of working with electrical or working with plumbing and that sort of thing. Like, maybe that information isn't quite as easily available. Um, so you've got a few different options. Um, again, you could talk to the manufacturers and, and uh, try to see if they have courses or information specific to their equipment. Um, and then there are some other places uh, like the Coffee Technicians Guild, which is fairly new. Um, which looks like it'll have an educational section um, kind of on their website in the future. So I would look to that. The, the Coffee Technicians Guild um, does events, uh, at least in North America that I know of, um, but also, you know, they have some uh, blogs that have great information. Um, and it sounds like they're going to have some educational resources down the line as well. Um, so hopefully that helps. I, I know that tech skills are not necessarily the most accessible thing in the coffee industry. Um, but hopefully that is changing so it's a little bit easier to learn these skills and learn to, you know, service and repair all this essential equipment that we have. 
All right, next question uh, comes from Marvin who asks, uh, what's your opinion on grind size for V60? Uh, and he's also asking about continuous pours versus pulsing uh, pulse pours. Um, I, so this is a cop out. I don't have an opinion really. Um, I like to brew coffee different ways um, because I think that there's sort of many roads to the same place and, and that, that place is a good cup of coffee. Um, I have had V60 brews that seem like they broke the rules. Um, you know, a fine grind with a like super full uh, bed and the, the water was poured basically at this trickle and it tasted amazing. And it was like fresh cherry juice. It was just super sweet and bright and delicious. Um, and I've had, you know, V60s that seem like they kind of follow the mold where they have, you know, a few pulse pours over the course of a couple minutes and, you know, uh, not a very adventurous way to brew, but it also still yielded a good cup of coffee. Um, so when I brew a V60, I tend to uh, do kind of circular pulse pours. Um, and that's just because I, I find it a little bit easier to kind of just pour a little bit, let it drain, pour a little bit, let it drain. It's just kind of my, uh, my preferred means of making coffee. Um, but again, I don't really think, I don't get the sense that there are like hard and fast rules for, for brewing like this. I think that you can kind of experiment. Um, and we have a great blog post uh, where we compare some different V60 recipes. Um, a few of them are fairly similar. A few of them are kind of out there. Um, so I think that there's a lot of great ways to make a good cup from a V60, similar to other brewers as well. You know, I, I don't think there are really rules that are universally true, true for a lot of different brewing methods. I think you can kind of experiment and still get a good result. Um, so our next question is from Barista Maniac, uh, the famous Barista Maniac, uh, who says, which gooseneck spout uh, kettle has the most aggressive pour that you carry. This was an interesting one to test uh, because it wasn't what we thought it might be. Um, at first we thought it might be something like the wave pot. This is the Kalita wave pot because it has this big fat belly. Um, now it also has this sort of tapered pinch spout. It's not a regular like um, circle or oval. Um, it is a little bit flatter. Um, we thought that this might have a fast flow rate just because it has that big wide open bottom and that means more water can at least enter the spout at the bottom. Turns out this Takahiro is the fastest pouring kettle that we carry. Um, we tested this by putting water in a variety of kettles. We also used the new Akaya Pearl S which has a flow rate readout. It'll tell you how many grams per second uh, are being poured into, in this case, a Chemex. Um, the Takahiro kettles are the fastest pourers, and I think that's just because they have a sort of wider di uh, diameter inside their spout all the way through, um, and they were pouring over 60 grams per second when we were testing. Um, the next one up was the uh, Hario Buono, which was uh, almost 60 grams, usually between 55 and 60 uh, when we were testing. So. Um, if you are looking for a very fast pour, uh, check out the Takahiro, check out the Bono. Um, the Bonavita stacked up reasonably well, or you know, kind of close as well. Um, it wasn't quite as fast as the Bono, but it was pretty close. Um, and the Wave Pot was, uh, didn't even hit 50 grams per second. So um, that was really interesting to find out because we were expecting it to be uh, pretty fast and it turns out it's just not. Um, Great pour control on it, uh, but it's not fast if you want it to be fast. I will say that the fastest kettle that we've ever had uh, in, in the office was made by KitchenAid. Um, that had a much thicker spout. Uh, we don't carry it, but we, we were able to test it out. It has a thick spout and it also has a flow restrictor down inside of the kettle. It's like a three stage sort of gate that you can kind of pull up and down. And that, that was a very fast flow rate. So if you're shopping for like a really fast pour that might have some good control, um, I don't know if the product came out, but KitchenAid made a kettle that had a really fast flow rate with good control as well. All right, and I believe this is our final question for the day. Uh, Creature Sin from Instagram asks, um, I was curious what sort of impacts brew column degree 
would have on coffee for pour overs. Examples being a V60 at 60 degree angle and the Phoenix 70 at a 70 degree angle or three cup, three cup Chemex versus the larger Chemex. Um, so they're talking about like sort of the angle of the cone filter. Um, I would say that it's not just the angle. Um, so a three cup Chemex uses a very thick filter. It's a steep angle, but it's a thick piece of paper and it's smooth glass walls that the paper is adhering to. So it drains fairly quickly, um, but something like the Phoenix 70, which has, uh, if I recall correctly, has sort of open walls. It doesn't, uh, there's not a lot of contact for the filter. That will drain a little bit more because there's more surface for the, the coffee to flow out of the filter. So um, cone shape, uh, it's, the, the actual brewing mechanics are kind of fuzzy to me. Um, my impression is that the steeper the cone, the less agitation you get from pores that are like going all the way down to the bottom, the tip of the cone. Um, a wider cone seems like it's more accessible for the water to sort of churn up that coffee and kind of stir it around and make sure it's moving. Um, I don't have good, uh, you know, uh, actual like data on what's going on in, in those cone filters. Um, so this is another question where it'd be really interesting to hear from you, you guys, our viewers, um, if you have uh, opinions or information on what cone angle does to a, a coffee brew and how it influences that extraction, just let us know. You know, definitely drop us a comment down below on YouTube or uh, you know, if you see us on Instagram or Twitter, you know, let us know. We'd love to hear from you and what you think about that. So guys, that is gonna be a wrap for episode two of our Q&A. We really wanna thank everybody for submitting questions. Um, it's really awesome to hear from everybody. And like I said, if you want to get your question in a future video, leave us a comment down below. Uh, give us a shout out on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, or write to us at questions at primo-coffee.com. And we'll catch you next time, guys. Thanks for watching.